I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture about amalgamated meat cutters versus Connolly, a district court case from the District of Columbia from 1971. This is a lecture for my administrative law class. This is the first case in the casebook that I use. And this case is really about the non-delegation doctrine and statutory vagueness and its antidotes. And the main useful thing about this case, it's not often cited, it's not binding precedent on other courts, is that it really illustrates sort of the, um, the state of the non-delegation doctrine in the late 20th century. So the main takeaway here is that the case illustrates how the non-delegation doctrine had evolved from the New Deal era to the 1970s. The court here interpreted the intelligible principles standard to mean that Congress need give only enough guidance so that when courts review agency actions under their enabling statutes, there are sufficient benchmarks to determine whether that action was lawful. So this is a little different than looking at the um, statutory text like they did in Schechter Poultry and, and analyzing whether it's there's too much vagueness and ambiguity or there's a separation of powers issue and the legislature is giving its um, legislating power over to the executive branch. Here we're talking about are there benchmarks so that we can uh, compare what the agency, a court can compare what the agency is doing um, to its uh, congressional mandate. Now let's talk about the act here. Um, in response to high inflation, Congress passed the Economic Stabilization Act, which gave President Nixon power to freeze prices and wages temporarily and to impose some tax uh, cuts and so forth within certain limitations. And the idea was to control um, runaway inflation and to stop price gouging and things like that. And um, I'm recording this in uh, 2022 and my students uh, watching this well, remember that during the uh, uh, COVID pandemic, that there were times where there were shortages of certain items like uh, toilet paper or paper goods at um, the stores. And then as we came into 2022, uh, prices, consumer prices started to go up and we have inflation because of disruptions in the supply chain and so forth. Um, so we had a similar situation, but even worse in the early 1970s. And so Congress acted to basically have these temporary kind of, we're gonna freeze everything and freeze all the prices and wages. And it allowed also that the president could delegate these decisions to executive branch officials. It's clear that Congress comp uh, um, contemplated that the president would set up a committee or a commission or agency to handle this. So it, to implement the act, President Nixon issued an executive order that mandated a 90-day freeze on prices, rents, wages, and salaries, among other measures. And the idea was, as you may think about it, uh, the last few years during the COVID crisis, that we had an eviction moratorium to uh, uh, keep people from uh, being evicted if they were out of work or due to the pandemic and so forth. Here, the idea was that in order to stabilize consumer prices and stop inflation, it was necessary to freeze the wages of workers who manufactured consumer goods. Now, as permitted under the act, the executive order delegated implementation and enforcement to um, a couple different bodies, but the main one we're concerned about in this case is the Cost of Living Council, which uh, John Connolly, who then was Secretary of the Treasury, was the designated chair. So thus, uh, Connolly is, ends up being the named defendant in this case, even though the opinion, to be honest, focuses entirely on the president's powers and actions. So we call this amalgamated meat cutters versus Connolly, but it's really all about the statute and how much power Nixon had under it. Now, a few months before this, let's meet the union here, there had been a protracted labor dispute between a, a nationwide union of meat cutters and butchers and their employers who were basically the meat packing plants and slaughterhouses. And um, the unions, uh, the union had finally reached um, a binding collective bargaining agreement that gave all the workers a 25 cent per hour raise. But, the, but here's the problem. This across the board wage increase had been accepted by the workers in exchange for several major concessions during their collective bargaining. 
And now the managers claimed that they could not honor the wage increase agreement due to the president's 90 day freeze on wages and salaries. In other words, we, we have a salary freeze. So sorry about the raise we were supposed to give all of you. Um, and so the union thought that they had fought long and hard for this raise. 25 cents an hour doesn't sound like a lot, but it adds up over the weeks and months. Um, and uh, and can make a difference in somebody's ability to, let's say, make rent. And so the union then brought suit and they, they didn't just sue their employers, although they sued them too, um, but they were challenging the legality of the executive order and the act that authorized it and that blocked the agreed upon raises. Um, and as I mentioned, the employers were also co-defendants in this case, but they're not named in the caption. Uh, their suit claimed that the act violated the non-delegation doctrine because it gave too much legislative power to the president. Now, the court held here that the Economic Stabilization Act was fine, that it was not an undele not unconstitutional delegation of legislative power to the president, even though it gave broad authority to the president to issue orders and rules to stabilize or freeze prices, rents, wages, and salaries. Um, and the reason for this was the built-in safeguards and limitations in the act. So again, instead of focusing on um, things like the, is the act vague, they're saying that the act does give some benchmarks that are just clear enough for a court to compare, use them as a, a, a comparison point for the agency's actions. And here's some examples. The court mentions that the, was uh, the shortener term nature of the measures. Remember, this is only, a, this is a three month um, price and uh, rage, wage freeze. It's not permanent. Um, and after the three months, we are, everything goes back to the way it was. Um, and, um, and the short-term nature of the delegations, there were exigent economic circumstances. Um, the country had a history of past price controls, especially in wartime. And um, there was a, sort of an implied statutory expectation that the president would regulate fairly and create standards to guide in the decisions. Um, and very importantly for the court here, there was a judicial review available. And the court said basically, because the statute provides judicial review and then gives some standards that a court could use as the basis for reviewing the agency's action, we don't see what there is to worry about. So basically the court says that these types of factors help ensure against arbitrary government decision-making or the, process, the specter of tyranny and things like that. Um, my students though should note that these factors do not address traditional concerns about Congress, let's say, retaining the role of fundamental policy choices and um, that the non-delegation doctrine originally was supposed to protect. Um, in other words, here we're focused more on checks and balances instead of separation of powers. I know that often we talk about those two as the same thing. Separation of powers was a form of checks and balances. But the court is he here is saying it doesn't really matter if Congress is letting the president make some laws or uh, some rules that have the force of law, because there's still some built in checks and balances that even it all out. Um, it's also worth noting, I just want to highlight a couple of things about this, uh, the majority opinion for you. The court relies heavily on the Yakis versus United States decision from the Supreme Court um, as the current version of the non-delegation doctrine. And Judge Leventhal's analysis refocuses the non-delegation away from separation of powers and political accountability to the objective of preventing arbitrariness or abuse of power. And that concludes our lecture about amalgamated meat cutters versus Connolly.